uh, participate together in communion at the end of the service. Um, and then just so you know, next week, uh, Pastor Kurt Henry is off from his sabbatical and uh, will be coming to do the message on Sabbath and some of, the, some of his findings over, the, over his sabbatical. So I would highly encourage you to come to that. I'm excited to hear uh, some of his findings and a little bit nervous too at the same time because I feel like once you know how you're supposed to Sabbath, you kind of have to do those things, right? So I know in this busy culture, that's very much opposite what we're used to, but I'm excited uh, for Kurt Henry's words um, next week. Um, and then for the summer, we're going to be jumping into a series on King David and what happened in his life before and during kingship. Uh, so we'll be spending, I think, 13 weeks on David. So super excited for that series to come after that. But this week, we get to look at Sabbath. Sacraments and sacraments are is is this really churchy word, right? If you've grown up in the church, you may have heard it periodically. If you haven't grown up in the church, you're like, "Hang on, what is this?" Uh, today, uh, we're gonna try put everyone on a level playing field and explain some of the ins and outs of this thing called sacraments that we we participate in as as a church. Um, so what, where we're going to start, there, there's nothing really worse than walking into a room and not understanding what's going on, right? That's why today we want to dive into sacraments because uh, maybe, maybe you've been coming here for a while, maybe you're brand new to this thing, and don't fully understand that when we break bread and drink the juice, like, why do we do those things? Or maybe when we baptize uh, young adults or, or infants, what, what does that mean? Why do we do those things? What's the importance of that? It, it may seem a bit foreign. So uh, we're going to jump into that. But there, there's nothing worse not, not understanding some of those things. Um, uh, to relate it back, when, when I was a youth pastor, the first thing I did in youth in ministry was be a youth pastor. I loved students. I loved hanging out with students. And you realize really quickly that they, they have their own language, right? They, they have their own words that they use. And uh, I still look in the mirror and see a young, young, hip youth pastor with maybe more of a receding hairline than I should. But I still, I still feel like I should be able to fully relate. Um, but there's words that they say now that the youths, right, is that how they want to be, the youths of today, uh, say that I'm like, what, what is that? Like, what, what are you guys even referencing? So I, I played around online a little bit this week and found some words, and I, we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, explaining some of these words to you, because I think this is, just, this is just hilarious. Okay, one of the things, one of, one of their words is fire, and it's not like, there's a fire, everyone run, it means that's, that's, I believe it's amazing. It's like, oh, so when you're saying what we say when we're supposed to be running, you're saying, oh, no, that's, that's a really good thing. Like, that's fire. Okay, sure, why not? Uh, the next one, bussin. Bussin means awesome. In context, it's like, these tacos are bussin. What? <laughs> sure, we'll go with that. Okay, the next one, a beige flag. I think this one is just wild. It means a quality or a characteristic of a significant other um, that is weird or off-putting, but not enough to reject them. <laughs> That's just great where it's like, okay, you got a character flaw that I don't really like, but it's not quite enough to break up with you, so that's a beige flag for me. I don't know what I'll do with it now, but maybe I'll deal with it later, right? The next one, uh, and the last one we have for today, is okay, boomer. <laughs> Anyone find offense to that? That one means calling out an idea that is outdated or resistant to change. Oh, devastating for some of us in the room, right? Like, oh man, what is this? And uh, I was having a lot of fun with these words. I was trying to use it throughout the day. And I, I was talking with Bree, our youth pastor, about it. And she's like, Matt, even those are a little outdated. God. So I can't even keep up with the, the, the language of the world. Uh, but uh, thinking about these things, thinking about words or ideas that when we walk into a room, we don't fully understand it. It's like this idea of when someone says these tacos are bussin', it doesn't mean they have like, they're extra spicy or there's lots of sour cream on it. What is on this bus and why are we talking about tacos in association with it? Right? The same idea is with sacraments for some of us. What does it mean? Why do we do the things we do? Why, what does the bread look like? And do you tear it? Do you dip it? Do, do you pass it out? What, what 
what are all of these things with it? What is the significance behind what we are doing? Um, and today, I want to change that. Let's look at some of this language. Let's look at some of the stories of the Bible in the New Testament and the Old Testament and see what the significance behind this so that when we come together as a church, when we come together as a community, we can, we can be excited about it because we know what we're actually participating in. So, practically, there are two sacraments as a Reformed tradition, as a, we're, we're community Reformed. As a Reformed church, we believe in two sacraments to participate in, communion and baptism, okay? We believe that those two things are, are worth participating in because those are the two that Jesus, and the only two that Jesus commanded people to do. And they're the only two that Jesus participated in himself. Okay, so baptism and communion. Um, and uh, that is what he ca has called God's people to actively participate in. So let's unpack these a bit. We're going to start with baptism and we'll wrap up with communion and then be able to participate in communion at the end of it. So baptism. Baptism is a sign and a seal of God's covenant of grace with us and our children. Right? Most often we see infants being baptized. Um, sometimes we see young adults or adults being baptized that have newly come into the faith. <clears throat> and it's this moment where we welcome them into the family of God. It's a symbol of that. That baptism moment isn't the moment of salvation. Okay, The moment of salvation for us, we fir firmly believe, is that when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. The baptism is the symbol of that moment um, that we remind ourselves that we've been adopted as sons and daughters of God. And that he has forgiven us of our sins and given us the Holy Spirit. Now the word baptism, uh, we, we really see this word being used most often in the New Testament. Uh, because Jesus, Jesus starts using this word uh, more fully. It's actually, we, we don't have time to get into it too much today, but it's, it's a covenant from Abraham that is fulfilled in baptism. Okay, so we find this in Matthew 28, first played out, Matthew 28, 19 to 20, when Jesus gives this command to his disciples. It says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Remember, we actually looked at this last week when Paul was taking these words, right? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the ends of the age. So remember that last week, the, the, this idea that the disciples took those words and Paul, not being a disciple, but having met Jesus in a significant way, took those words to heart. And that's when we see the, the church, the early church, just explode. Right? They go from, from uh, city to city proclaiming the good news about Jesus Christ, planting new churches, and that's what this, most of the New Testament is about, these letters written to the new, the, these new churches. And Paul, who was the writer of 2 Corinthians that we just spent all that time in, also wrote a book to the church of Galatia. And in this, he writes, he writes this to them. Galatians 3.27 says, As many of you were baptized into Christ. So he's saying like they've planted this church of Galatia and they were baptizing people as they came to know Jesus Christ. As you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. So we see this being lived out that once you are baptized into Jesus Christ, the other things shouldn't matter anymore. Uh, the, the way we identify ourselves, maybe it's Republican, Democrat, uh, maybe it's male or female, right? Slave or unslave, right? All of these things are washed away because we are now one in Jesus Christ. And Paul, Paul is showing us that. But what I love um, about these sacraments is especially uh, baptism, even though we see this uh, fully, fully come uh, from tuition into in the New Testament, we see glimpses of what it could be in the Old Testament. And I want to spend a little bit of time today looking into the Old Testament where we get some glimpses of echoes of what Jesus fulfilled. Okay, so today I want to start in Exodus 14. If you got your Bibles, you can turn there. I think they'll be on the screen as well. But in Exodus. 
In the moment where we're picking up our story, uh, the Israelites have been enslaved to the Egyptians. And there's a moment where all uh, God sends Moses and we see plagues come. And finally, Pharaoh releases the Israelites from the Egyptians. And the Israelites are then on their way to uh, the promised land. And what do they find in their way? The Red Sea. Okay, so they're literally in between like the armies coming to chase them and they've got this sea in front of them that is pretty much impassable, right? It's not one you just wade across or swim across. Um, and they're between, between these two and they start shouting, right? They're grumbling against God. They're shouting at Moses like, you've brought us out here to die. You, you brought us out of Egypt and now we're going to die in the middle of the desert. That's where we pick up our story. Uh, starting Exodus 14, verse 13, says this. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? It's almost this posture from God like, I, I've just rescued you from Egypt. I've not forgotten you. I, I, I've got this covered. Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over to the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all of his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh and his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God who had been traveling in front of Israel's army withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them. They, they were guiding them through the desert. Okay, So they, they moved to the back then to protect them. Coming between the, the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other side. So neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And all that night, the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground and with a wall of water on their right and on their left. See, just as the Israelites walked through on dry ground to safety, we see this glimpse of salvation for them. Right there at this moment where they are faced with uh, Pharaoh's armies coming to potentially kill them, um, and bring them back into slavery. And on the other side is life and salvation. Um, but one thing I would argue we know to be true is we don't have to go through the sea, do we? Right? We can stop at the front of it and face whatever's coming alone. But I would argue that God always offers salvation on the other side. Right? For, for us, there's this first glimpse, this first moment of understanding that with water, walking through the water, walking through God's path that he has for us brings about salvation. <clears throat> and for us, as a church, what we do with this, uh, what we realize when we, when we wipe a baby's forehead with water or, or maybe we dunk young adults, adults or adults who have confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, we recognize this moment as their moment, moment of being new believers and we realize that it takes a community. That some of the language we use is we have the whole church stand up and uh, commit to walking alongside of these new believers and these infants. We believe strongly that it matters to have, to, to be surrounded by like-minded people who are actively pursuing relationship with God and to be running full tilt together into the storm of life. And when we stand and when we make statements to these new believers in Christ, we realize that the faith that we hold on to was never meant to be walked alone. That we should walk alongside and guide each other from the wisdom of God. So I want to challenge you and encourage you to be active in that. When we stand up, when we commit to people who are new in their faith, to actually not just commit to walking in with them at church, 
but to actually commit to helping them in their faith journey. That walking through the water doesn't mean it's not scary, that it, there's not hard times, that there isn't unknowns when the water is up on the sides. But what we realize is that it's a promise that we make as a church and we make as individuals to the people around us. So I want to challenge you, if you're, today we're celebrating volunteers because we know it, that is what it takes to pull off this thing called church. Right, but if you're not actively serving, I want to challenge you into that. That as a community, we are called to walk with each other, to help in nursery, to help with kids, to show them who Jesus is and teach them the stories, uh, to sign up for VBS, to walk with our youth group students during the year, uh, to help with men's and women's ministries, and uh, realizing that uh, we are called to be an active part in that. This Sunday thing should not be the only thing we do. It should be a day in, day out where we're living life with people for God. Okay, so that's baptism, all right? Let's take that and put that off to the side for just a minute because we're going to switch gears and move into communion. Um, and I think, uh, I, I love communion, I love being able to partake in it today, but we're going to first look at uh, this moment, the first moment of communion or the, the first communion that took place. We see this in the New Testament where Jesus is with his 12 disciples and he's gathered them together and uh, he shares some language like, uh, this is my body that is given for you. This is my blood that was shed for you. And I don't think the disciples fully realize what is happening in that moment or fully realize that this is the last moment that they'll be sharing over a meal with the man they've been following for years, their, their Messiah, their Savior. And I want to share this moment with you. Um, Jesus says this after he's gathered all the disciples around. It says, while they were eating, this is out of Mark 14, starting at verse 22. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. When we had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood, the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. See, that, that's a little symbol that Jesus is saying, this is the last time. Like, remember this moment. See, and I would argue that the disciples didn't fully understand that like I said, that that moment would be the last they would share with Jesus around a meal. But what I think is so interesting is at that same time, they, one of the reasons they, the disciples were gathered together right then was because of a festival. And that festival was the festival <clears throat> of unleavened bread. Okay, which brings us back to a story back in Exodus as well, which was right before when the Israelites were released from um, Egypt. Okay, so follow me. So Jesus, the, all the disciples and Jesus are meeting together for this festival, but it's a festival that starts with Passover, and they celebrate Passover where a lamb is then slain, um, and, and that signifies the blood from a story in Exodus. So come with me to a story in Exodus uh, where um, uh, we find the Israelites are in the midst of the, uh, all the plagues that is covering Egypt before they are released from Egypt. Okay, um, One of the last plagues, uh, God sends uh, the angel of death and he says, if you don't cover your door frames with the blood of the lamb, your firstborn will be killed. Um, so what we find is all the Israelites do this, and they, they celebrate in this first Passover because the angel passed over them and it kept them safe. So what we find here is the disciples in this first communion moment are, are celebrating communion or have just celebrated communion, and now what's so fascinating about this is Jesus is about to become that very sacrifice that they had been celebrating for Passover. Okay, so when we partake in communion, when we celebrate in that together, we take the bread and we drink the juice and we remember that sacrifice that Jesus had made once and for all. No longer 
Do we need to make all these sacrifices? That's why we don't, we don't really celebrate Passover in the way they used to, where, where a lamb is killed at the temple, because we believe in one who has already been killed for sins past, present, and future. Jesus covered all of those things, and so we don't participate in that anymore. We believe in what Jesus came to do, but instead, we remember this moment, and we remember his death, and we understand that all of those things that Jesus did covers all the sins we have ever committed. Now, um, for baptism, this is... Okay, so looking back, baptism. Baptism is, as Reformed theology, we believe, is a one-time event. Our baptism, we do not need to be re-baptized after we sin. Okay, we, we understand that it is a one-time thing where we are now in the church family of God, and we believe in those things. Uh, communion is something that we partake in uh, quite a bit here. It's, is it every six weeks? Six, seven? Every two months. Eight weeks-ish. So we, we do that every eight weeks, every two months, in order to remember the sacrifice that God has made. So communion, we do it way more often. And I, I would think in a perfect world, uh, if we participated in baptism and we remember communion, we partake in communion, uh, if we do it the right way, if we do it the perfect way, we would never need to do it again. Right? If we're perfect, that means we're never sinning, so we don't ever need to re-remember what Jesus has done because we're now perfect. But we can all agree that, that that's not the truth. Right? right? Shortly after, I actually want to, before we jump into that, I want to tell you about the Israelites again and what happens after Jesus, or right after they go through the Red Sea. Okay? So we're going to jump into a story um, in Exodus 16 now, so we're two chapters after them walking through the Red Sea on dry ground. Remember, uh, recognize all of the things that God has done at this point, right? He's got them through dry ground. He has released them from Egypt. All of these things have happened, and now they find themselves in the desert. And this is where our story picks up. We're going to do verses 1 through 3, and then jump ahead to 11 and 18. So it says this, the whole Israelite community set out, from <clears throat> set out from Elam and came to the desert of, desert of Sinai, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. Um, I think it's significant there that we see a date, uh, because that is about one month after they had left, after they had crossed the Red Sea. Okay, uh, so about a month after. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. So what we find is a month after God does all of these incredible things, the Israelites are grumbling. They're mad. They're angry. They're like, well, why are we not getting fed now? They, they have completely forgotten who God is. <coughs> Continues. Can you hand me my water there? <clears throat> All those fluffy things in the air this week have not been good for my allergies. The Lord said to Moses, <clears throat> verse 12, I have heard the grumblings of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening, quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it is. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord's commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer, which, it, which is an amount back in that day, for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some gathered little. And when they measured it by the omer, the one who had gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they had needed. See, it's easy, <clears throat> I would argue, to sit back and read this story and be highly critical of the Israelites. Anyone else in that camp? Like you look at you look at this story of Exodus and you say, 
Oh my word, God has provided for you in so many ways. Right? He's brought Moses to release them from Egypt, this exodus out of slavery. And then they get between uh, the, the Red Sea and, the, and Pharaoh's army coming against them. And God splits the Red Sea so they can walk through on dry ground. And he completely saves them. And there's this salvation moment through the Red Sea. And now they're headed towards the promised land. And not a month after all of these things, all of these miraculous moments, they start questioning who God is already, right? And we can sit here and read this story, and I do this. The first time I read this, I'm like, are you kidding? Like, how, how dare you forget who your God is? Like, it just, I can't even comprehend it. You've just seen all of these incredible things, and now you're already questioning who God is. But then I start to think, do I have an Egypt moment? Do I have a moment in my life where God has shown up in incredible ways? And not a few weeks after, do I start to question when my life isn't going exactly as I had planned? How quickly do I forget when God has shown up in my life? What would the answer be for you? Right? What is your Egypt moment? What may have God brought you through? See, some of you may right now be in the very thick of it and may be having a hard time seeing where God is or what he's doing. And we all bring in something different here. But that doesn't mean that God isn't doing something or that God isn't still present. As I challenge you to look back and remember what God has done in your life. See, the Bible, before um, it was written down, so I, I think uh, the Pentateuch, so the first five books, all of that was, uh, was communicated orally. It wasn't written down first. And I think we've, there was so much power in doing that because they were forced to sit around fires and tell the stories. Tell the stories of God's faithfulness for their people. Tell the stories of, oh, Grandpa did this, and this is how God showed up in Grandpa's life. Or great-great-grandpa did this, and this is how God continued to be faithful in their family line. There, there's a beauty in sitting around and sharing the story of God and sharing how God is faithful. And I think we've lost that. That our lives are so busy that culture continues to throw speed into our lives that we need to do all of these things that we forget. We move, on, we move on so quick that we forget where God is faithful in our lives. We easily, uh, we're not afraid to tell others when things aren't going right, but we don't often say when God has been faithful in our lives. See, I think we need to change our posture. And remember what God has done in our lives and continue to bring those stories up. Because I think when we do that, we put on a different lens. Because even in the hardship, even in the worry and the, the difficult situations in our lives, if we know that God has been faithful in our past with other things, we know that God will continue to be faithful in the muck that we currently live in. See, I want us to understand, and I remind myself of this even in our higher times, is that God is faithful and will continue to be faithful. And we look at sacraments and baptism and communion, especially as this moment of remembering that, that God is faithful and will continue to be faithful in our lives as long as we continue to trust in him and what's he's, what he's been doing. So that is why we come together for communion. That is why we celebrate baptism. So that we remember that God is faithful and that he is always faithful. And I would challenge you as we come together for communion today and in eight weeks when we do it again and in 16 weeks after that, that you come to the table with a different posture of walking forward and thinking about where God has shown up in your life and remembering where God has been faithful. 
Jesus in that last in that last meal with his disciples said do this in remembrance of me and often we just do this but we don't fully remember what God has done and what Jesus has done on the cross and how Jesus has shown up in our lives church I challenge you to do that differently this week especially as we walk up to the table now before we do that let's go to God in prayer Heavenly Father, um, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that as, as we look at the stories of baptism and communion, and we look throughout the Bible, that, that we realize it's, it's one story, that you, even though we see dozens of authors, that you have, you have prescribed that to us as one book. And we see the beauty and the knowledge and the understanding that, that it all speaks together towards one thing, is that you are faithful and that you are loving. And I want us to understand as we step into communion today, not only the work that Jesus has done for us on the cross, but that, that one moment that you continue to show up in our lives and you continue to be faithful for us. God, I ask that we remember that as we walk up to communion today. In your name we pray. Amen.